most dangerous job. Death only a split second away. Come fly with America's heroes, its best fighter pilots, America's real top guns. I'm Randy Cunningham, call sign Duke. I was lucky enough to shoot down five enemy MiGs in the skies over North Vietnam. I'd like to pass on to you the lessons learned during that war. From the earliest days of military flying, the spirit of attack has carried the fight in aerial combat. No matter how primitive or how sophisticated the aircraft, it's been the aggressiveness and the ability of the pilot that keeps them alive. The most daring World War I aces ran up amazing numbers of kills. The famous Red Baron of Germany, Baron Manfred von Richthofen, shot down over 80 Allied pilots. And his statement was, a fighter pilot roves in the area allotted to him in any manner he sees fit. When he sees the enemy, he attacks and kills. Anything else is rubbish. The crewed aircraft and weapons of that war demanded much from their pilots. To be successful, to survive, one had to have great physical endurance and dexterity, plus excellent eyesight, good marksmanship, and quick reflexes. No wonder the best World War I fighter pilots were athletes, hunters, or even race car drivers. In the Second World War, German pilots initially had the advantage of training and experience. Their kill ratios over the British was staggering. After America entered the war and provided advanced fighter planes, the score evened up. By the war's close, Allied pilots had eliminated the best German pilots. Lacking trained aviators, the Germans lost 20 aircraft for every one of ours shot down. War jet jockeys flew F-86 Sabre jets against Chinese MiG-15s. Combined closing speeds between two fighters engaged in head-to-head -head fighting reach more than 1,000 miles per hour. Our weapons change from the previous war, but basic air-to-air -air tactics to determine who wins remains the same and has changed little since the days of Baron von Richthofen. Vietnam strike pilots were forced to fly low-level attacks against ground targets due to deadly radar, AAA, and intensive surface-to-air SA-2 missile firings. This lethal air-to-air -air defense was responsible for shooting down 26 American planes in just five days during a major Vietnam offensive. The gut-wrenching fear that each of us feels when a SAM missile tracks you through the skies is almost indescribable. You had to be there.
the strike on Quang Lang Airfield, 19 January 1972, I had 36 SAMs fired at me in pairs. That gut-wrenching feeling that I just described was evident in every one of those launchings. You look in the direction of the SAM launch. You can see the dust and debris from the exhaust engines. You can then see the missile, which is the size of a telephone pole track. You first move your airplane and watch the missile. If the air missile moves in the direction that you're going, then you know that the missile is after you. You wait, you wait and wait. And at the last minute, that Mach 3 missile, which has to turn at three times the Gs that you do at your 500 knot airspeed, won't make the corner. I had told other pilots that a SAM would never bring me down. Then on 10 May 1972, while on a strike south of Hanoi, the SAM that brought me down was an unseen one. When the Showtime F-4 was hit by a surface-to-air missile, I can remember it rolling upside down. And not wanting to be a prisoner of war, I asked for some divine help. I thought, God, get me out of this one. I don't want to be a POW. Took the stick, put it over to the left side. The airplane righted itself. I lit their afterburner and started it out toward the Gulf of Tonkin. About this time, the airplane rolled back upside down, and I thought, God, I didn't mean it. I was able to roll the F-4 when the nose locks straight up in the F-4 when you lose hydraulics. I was able to roll it around an axis, but yet not to stall it. I would light full afterburner, keep the airplane rolling until I got about one mile off of the beach. The airplane exploded where we were forced to eject over the Gulf of Tonkin. Generally, the pilots in North Vietnam had very poor skills. They were trained in Russia and China and Czechoslovakia. Every once in a while, we would run up against a very competent pilot. They had about five of these individuals that would fly all three kinds of airplanes, being the MiG-17, the MiG-19, and the MiG-21. This is the type of an individual that Colonel Toon proved to be. A pilot lives to shoot down another airplane. That's what he trains for, and that's what he has his mind intent on. When the event happens, every muscle and every attitude, every thought is directed to that. Listen up. As a 105 driver splits off from his flight, engages eight MiG-17s, he treated it like it was a game. Listen to his voice. U.S. fighter pilots bagged 110 MiGs while losing 48 of our own. This tragic 2.3 to 1 ratio was devastating compared to the Korean kill ratio of a 10 to 1. As a result, Navy Fighter Weapons School was established, now called Top Gun, to combat and train pilots to effectively maneuver against a tight turning enemy. At Navy Fighter Weapons School and the aggressor squadrons, the A-4 is used to simulate the MiG-17 below about 270 knots. Above 270 knots, the F-5E performs very characteristically like a MiG-21. Pilots ease off on the G to also simulate the MiG-23. On board an aircraft carrier, the USS Constellation, in mid-January 1972, we received word that we were no longer restricted to just bombing targets. We were able to go out, hunt, seek, and destroy MiGs for the first time since 1967 when President Johnson terminated the bombing in North Vietnam. 
On 19 January, while operating over Quanglang Airfield, I was lucky enough to engage two MiG-21s after dodging some 36 SAMs. I was able to break in about a 6G turn, point my nose toward the ground when I looked up and saw two MiG-21s. I closed the low MiG, fired a missile at about one mile. The MiG turned in about an 8G turn. His wingman flat ran and left him. The missile went off behind the MiG, and as he reversed, I fired the second missile. The second missile impacted the MiG, and he exploded as he rolled head over heels right through a VC village. On 8 May 1972, I was on a MiG cap. We were to position RF-4 as between a military target and the enemy MiG bases in Yen Bai. We got a vector toward Yen Bai after unknown contacts. The strike force was striking the target behind us and we got orders to return. Just about that time, our GCI controllers came up on the radio and said, Showtime, you have MiGs at 6 o'clock. I pulled the airplane in the vertical, rolled upside down, and saw a MiG-17 at Brian's tail. I ordered him to make the defensive maneuver while trying to pull in to shoot the MiG off of his tail. During this time, two MiG-17s passed 180 out from us and turned down at my 6 o'clock. I fired the first missile in which the MiG turned into, and then for some reason, which was a mistake on his part, he reversed his turn right in front of me. Perhaps he thought his MiGs were going to nail me. We fired the second missile. This MiG blew up. In the meantime, we had tracers coming from the MiGs behind us. Brian had pitched up at 2 o'clock. We had put a 12G turn on our airplane to get avoid the MiGs tracers. He closed and rendezvoused. I had to unload the airplane, dive into the clouds, just to lose him. We accelerated to 600 knots, pulled up in the vertical, and the MiGs followed us. Brian called tally-ho on the MiG-17s, rolled in after them, and they went back into the clouds. We chased but couldn't find them. Five minutes later, a pair of Air Force F-4 shot down two MiG-17s. I'd like to think it was the same MiGs that were tracking me. 10 May 1972, I pulled off a target just south of Hanoi over Hai Duong Railroad Yard. As I pitched off target, I was looking to the right-hand side, looking at the target. My wingman, Brian Grant, called Duke, MiG-7 o'clock. As I reversed, there were tracers coming by the canopy. I broke into the MiG. He overshot. I reversed, looking and watching his wingman pull up in the vertical behind me. I reversed and shot. And this is why I say you fight like you train, because the only thing I had to do when that MiG overshot is pull the trigger. I couldn't have gone back inside, set 35 mils in the gun sight, set arm and set sidewinder as a lot of people hadn't done before. We accelerated out, got away from the MiG that was chasing us, pitched back into the vertical, looked back and saw 12 MiG-17s in a defensive wheel. That's one MiG behind the other. And in that wheel, we had Phantoms chasing those MiGs. I rolled down into the MiGs, trying to track one that was coming around the corner like this that hopefully didn't even see me. About that time, an F-4 passed in front of us who turned out to be my executive officer. I pitched up in the vertical like this, straight over the fight, only to see a MiG-17 behind my XO at a 7 o'clock, a MiG-21 a little bit farther behind, and what he didn't see was a MiG-17 flying on his wing. As I came down out of the perch position, trying to shoot the closest MiG off of his tail and trying to get the XO to reverse to set, him, set the MiG up, we had, out of that turn, four MiG-17s, four MiG-19s, two MiG-19s, and four MiG-21s chasing us. For this, I was nominated for the Congressional Medal of Honor. I didn't think I was going to survive that fight, but I made a radio transmission to the XO saying, I don't think I'm going to survive, but I'll at least take the MiG off of your tail. I was lucky enough to shoot the MiG that was chasing him. The MiG blew up. The 421s came down on him. I called the XO to reverse, he did, the MiGs turned and then broke out and ran back toward Hanoi. Now we're headed out. We already have two MiG kills and I look and see a single MiG-17 coming head on. I passed the MiG head on, went into the vertical and most MiGs ran. The pilot capability was not very good. So I expected him to head for Hanoi. Coming back into the pure vertical, I put my airplane going about 500 knots straight up, look back expecting to see this MiG running. But instead, as I looked back over the canopy, I saw a little set of Gomer goggles, a little Gomer scarf, and Colonel Toon going vertical, vertical with me, going through about 15,000 feet. I went over the top, he shot, I broke down, made a mistake, and put him right where I didn't want him at my 6 o'clock. Unloaded the airplane, put about 500 knots on it, 
broke into him, forced him to overshoot, and at this point, I thought that I had him by the tail feathers. Reversed, went upside down, he looked, broke into me, forced me to overshoot, and this is what we call a rolling scissors. Disengaged from that maneuver, a guy named Dave Frost had taught me how to disengage when he's got an advantage to break as he turns to keep on pulling and then unload the airplane and accelerate out. I did this twice. The, minute, the whole fight took about four minutes. On the third pass, we're coming canopy to canopy. For some reason, he started pulling up early, a nice easy pull. So right here, I chopped the throttles, put out my speed brakes, dropped the flaps, and the MiG flew right in front of me. Now I'm standing here at 120 knots with an airplane that can outturn me two to one. I was thinking about just getting out of the engagement because I was so close I couldn't shoot him with a missile. But instead, Colonel Toon departed his airplane, went down, and I thought, well, I'm still going to run, but he still headed away. I reversed, fired a missile, the missile came off, impacted him, and I started following him down at that point. During the engagement, I saw the stars, the 13 stars of Colonel Toon on his aircraft, but was little aware that it was actually Colonel Toon in the airplane. Later, it was proven that, in fact, Colonel Toon was a pilot of that MiG-17 on 10 May 1972 that went down in flames. After the Vietnam War, the Navy elected to retain the Navy Fighter Weapons School, or Top Gun. Its results were very effective, giving us a 12 to 1 kill ratio in Vietnam. After the war, I came back as a Top Gun instructor. And then in later years, I then went on to command VF-126, the Navy Aggressor Squadron. The MiG-29 and the MiG-31, the Navy Fighter Weapons School and Aggressor Squadron uses the new F-16N, which has very similar characteristics. Okay, the lead just went in a right-hand turn to south, come hard left, 180, check on the nose a mile. You got a bogey, 6 o'clock for 6,000 feet. Keep turning, we're coming around hard on him. Okay. It's better to make your mistakes in training against a top instructor than it is a real MiG, because you're not competing for six gold medals. Whether you win or lose determines whether you live or die. And it's important in our training program to create the most realistic environment that we possibly can. Lock it out, lock it out, lock it it's out. also inherently dangerous in air combat training. A good friend of mine, Bobby Hughes, while on a training mission in an A-4, gave lead pursuit to an F-14. We've had a mid-air, repeat, we've had a mid-air. Roger, red one poppers, I'll hold high. Piper is going to cap. Uh, don't anybody get below these things right now in case there's a shoot coming down. The F-14 didn't see him. They impacted, and Bobby Hughes was killed. The F-14 crew was forced to eject. What we strive on a daily basis to do is to ensure that those kinds of things don't happen. Cruiser 21. Cruiser 24. Anybody see a shoot? No shoot. We started out, you were in a position where you'd uh, committed nose high on me, and I was pretty slow, so I extended... The purpose of Top Gun is to train Navy fighter pilots that are the best in their squadron. They then return to that squadron and train the pilots at, and backseaters that didn't have the opportunity to go through Top Gun to become the finest aviators in the world. In the movie Top Gun, most of the flying scenes were conducted in strictly the horizontal, an airplane chasing each other. A real fight takes place three-dimensionally not only in the horizontal, but vertically as well. If you can get your opponent to shoot, overshoot in the vertical and roll and get behind him, or he can even be above you and you can break into him and force the overshoot, that's the method we use to train. While all of this is going on, you may have one airplane that passes you. You have to mentally plot this airplane, knowing if he's a MiG-17, 21, or whatever, because you know how fast he turns, and you learn this in training. Now what I'm thinking is, can he get back around to shoot me before I can get from my position to get over and shoot somebody ahead of me? And what I'll do a lot of times is press that target. If I think no, or something changes in the dynamic environment, then I'll turn back into where I think the MiG is. And in many cases, we'll end up with a head-on pass, but yet I've saved myself. The only way to develop this kinesthetic sense of where you are in relation in space and time 
is through absolute training. Quite often, the graduation exercise in Top Gun is inviting fighter pilots from all over the world in the United States. What they do is act as the bad guys. The Top Gun class prepares and executes a strike plan using real attack airplanes, live ordnance delivered on a target. In every scenario, they're outnumbered, and they have to win and survive. The reason is that winning and surviving is everything. Six o'clock for 6,000 feet. Everything. Okay, I can be in on it, Baron Roy. Can't get flared in. I'll stay right there and get him. Watch the guy now. Two, three, five for six coming at you. Go meet him head on, thing. Okay, I got him. At the conclusion of this exercise, after many shots are fired on both sides until one side is gone, it's debriefed. There are no real losers because the information that we learn will protect you in the skies for tomorrow. Navy Fighter Weapons School is at NAS Miramar in San Diego. Although Top Gun pilots that have been trained are all over the world, you'll find an aircraft carrier on almost every ocean of the world. Those pilots consistently train the other pilots that didn't have the opportunity to train at the Navy Fighter Weapons School or Top Gun. pilots in the fleet, the greatest stress is not often the actual air-to-air -air combat. A Navy pilot that spends 20 years in the service, 25% of us are killed. That excludes even combat. So there's all kinds of things that can happen to a Navy pilot. We've learned a lot, a lot from foreign countries, primarily the Israelis. They train on a day-to-day -day basis. The threat that they have has lasted for over 2,000 years. The primary thing that we've learned from the Israelis, not so much the air-to-air -air environment, but the air-to-ground environment. Vietnam was a kitty lane compared to what our pilots of today have got to face. They have to go into environments of high threat, triple A with increasing number of SAMs and the Israelis have taught us how to take out those threats prior to the air-to-air -air battle ever taking place. In the real world, you need to go through and mentally plot what the things that have happened to you in training. They study everything about a Russian pilot, how he breathes, to how he eats, to how much he earns, everything about the Communist Party. A MiG aircraft has zero kill probability sitting on the ground. It has no capability whatsoever until you put that man in it. The type of man you put in it is what we're fighting. We're fighting his ideology, his thoughts, and his beliefs. So when someone says, I'm out to fight the machine, to me that's ludicrous. The real reason you're fighting that airplane is because of the man in it and to take him out. As early as 1914, 1915, Oswald Boca, one of the first tacticians in World War I, established dictums on how to survive and kill in the air. Some of those dictums, speed is life, 
Stay unpredictable. Never fly straight and level for more than about 10 seconds. Use an altitude advantage. Try and hide from your enemy and attack when he doesn't know that you're coming. Believe in yourself and train yourself mentally and physically for the ordeal ahead. Many people ask me, is the movie Top Gun realistic? If you take a look at our aircraft carrier, USS Ranger, she's on station right now in the Gulf defending our tankers. Recently, we fired two missiles at an Iranian MiG. Those same pilots were trained only six months ago, and they knew that in a matter of weeks, they could end up in a combat situation. If you draw a parallel between the scenario of the movie Top Gun and the way the USS Ranger is executing this mission today, you'll find them very close. a war, but if one comes, we have to be prepared to fight it. Our Top Gun pilots train all the other pilots to speak from a position of strength. If the enemy chooses to attack us, he's going to get a big surprise. Let him come ahead, and he won't do it again. station in the Indian Ocean. American sailors and air crews are here to protect vital American interests. The threat unknown. The defense top gun training. <laughs> 